letter basics beyond the eight legs. Hello YouTube. If you have ever been curious about, fascinated by, or terrified of spiders, keep watching because this is for you. I'm Travis, I'm an amateur arachnologist. I research spiders and make videos about them. Many of you are already familiar with my Spiders in Your House series, where I do deep dives on individual species of spiders. This is episode one in a new series, Spider Basics Beyond the Eight Legs. Spiders are full of surprises, and we see absolutely wondrous variety from one kind to another. Some are incredible engineers, some are masters of disguise or mimicry, some are amazing acrobats, and some display evidence of an intelligence we've only scratched the surface of. And there's enormous diversity in the different ways different spiders put the same set of tools to work in catching prey and living their lives. And yet, they're all spiders. And this series will examine the common threads that run between all of them, looking at spiders in general, what they are, how they work, and how they go through life and do what they do. We may dispel some common misconceptions along the way, because there's a lot of wrong information out there on the internet, and as I always say, less wronger is more better. Each episode will explore a particular topic, such as what makes a spider a spider and not something else? Why are they important? And are they possibly just as important as bees? How are spiders classified? And how can different families of spiders be so different from each other? What does a spider life cycle look like? And how do they go from helpless eggs to masterful hunters? How do spiders perceive their world? Most spiders are nearly blind, so how are they so aware of their surroundings? What's the anatomy of a spider? Where are its heart, lungs, stomach, and other stuff? Silk. How do they make it? And why on earth do they need to be able to make so many different kinds of this stuff? What are some of the different ways they capture prey, from pouncing to literally throwing silk nets? What is spider venom and how does it work? And how do these spiders find each other, impress each other, and make baby spiders? I'll put these videos in their own playlist so they form their own series, and by the time we're done with the series, you'll have a good understanding of their fascinating skills, specialties, and how they benefit us. You'll have answers to some of the questions that keep you up at night, and you'll have an entire arsenal of facts that your significant other is going to beg you to not bring up at parties. But you're probably going to anyway. So without further ado, let's begin. There's virtually nobody alive today who has never encountered a spider. They inhabit every continent except Antarctica, every climate, and basically every human structure ever built. So we've all got sort of an instinctive sense of what spiders are. They're bugs, in the colloquial sense of the word. We all know they've got eight legs. We all know they can spin silk. We know they're hunters that eat other bugs. We know that they're venomous to some degree. And we know that every single one of the brown ones is definitely a brown recluse. Just kidding, they are not. The problem is, every one of these things can be said of other animals that aren't spiders. So, what makes a spider a spider, and other eight-legged things, other eight-legged things? Most of us never really stop to ponder that question, but it turns out it's the perfect place to start when we want to really learn about these creatures. We can list the features that all spiders have, but that other animals might have as well, just not in the same particular combination. We can also look for features that all spiders have, and only spiders have. And there is such a feature in spiders, seen nowhere else in the animal kingdom, and it has to do with how these creatures reproduce. But before I get to that, let's start with a broad statement about spiders. Spiders are predatory terrestrial arthropods. Predatory, simply meaning that they hunt other living animals. Terrestrial, meaning that they come from a faraway planet and are bent on our destruction, and we'll need iconic and courageous heroes to thwart their plans of world domination. No, no, that's extraterrestrial. Terrestrial just means that they live on land and not in the water. There's an exception to that, but I won't get into it here. And they are arthropods. So, what are arthropods? Arthropod comes from the Greek for jointed leg, 
and Arthropoda is a phylum within the animal kingdom. And it includes insects, centipedes, millipedes, crustaceans, arachnids, and some other kinds of animals. They're defined by having pairs of segmented legs, no backbone, so they're invertebrates, and an exoskeleton, meaning they don't have internal bones like we do. Their skeletons are on the outside of their body. And if you're a pedantic nerd like me, now that you know this, a lot of Halloween decorations are going to make you irrationally angry. The exoskeleton is made of something called chitin, which is pretty rigid and hard. So in order for arthropods to grow, they have to shed their exoskeleton every once in a while, after having grown a new, softer one underneath. When the old one comes off, the soft new one allows the animal to expand into the new stretchy one, kind of like pulling that sleeping bag out of the pouch it came in for the first time and knowing it's never going to fit back in there ever again. After a few days, the new exoskeleton hardens, and the process begins all over again. This is something all arthropods do. Insects, arachnids, crustaceans, all go through this process as they grow. Now we all knew a kid growing up who loved correcting people when they referred to spiders as insects. And if you're watching this video, there's a good chance you were that kid. Spiders are arachnids, not insects. Both insects and arachnids are classes of arthropods, but they're different from each other. A defining feature of arachnids is that they've all got eight legs, which is the very first thing all of us learned about spiders. So while all spiders are arachnids, this, 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 and this are also all arachnids, and none of them are spiders. A couple of arachnids, like these two, can look an awful lot like spiders, but are also not spiders. So the arachnids are a somewhat broad group as well, but there are a few things all arachnids have in common that set them apart from, say, insects or other classes of arthropod. First, as I mentioned, they have eight legs, while insects only have six. Second, they do not have antennae. They have a different array of sensory organs. Third, they do not have wings, perhaps thankfully, I mean, imagine one of these things, but it can fly. Just fill your head with that mental image for a second. Until we meet again! Something that all arachnids do have are these things called chelicerae, which are these moving mouth parts that are used to grasp and sometimes inject venom into prey. You get a good look at these chelicerae when spiders groom themselves, or sometimes when they're eating. My favorite unofficial term for these is chompelbomps, which is not my word, someone else came up with it, but I love it. And in spiders, these are the parts the fangs are attached to. Now, most of the time, they look something like this. Just a couple of big furry bumps that can move side to side. Occasionally, they're enormous, like on this male zebra jumping spider. Look at the size of these things. Chelicerae can take different forms in other non-spider arachnids. In scorpions, the chelicerae don't really have fangs, but rather these little mini pincers that tear little bits of food off larger chunks. In solifuges, the chelicerae also have this pincer-type structure, and in mites and ticks, it's just even weirder, and well, it can vary a lot. The other feature all arachnids share is that while it might not always look like it, they've all got a basic two-part body plan. Insects have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, while arachnids have what's called a cephalothorax, or prosoma, and an abdomen, or epistosoma. Let's have a look at some arachnids that aren't spiders. In the case of harvestmen, the two body sections are sort of fused together, so the whole body just looks like one sort of lump. In scorpions, the sections can be extended, this part is cephalothorax, and everything south of that is all abdomen. And of course, the terminology is confusing, because people are still debating it. Generally, cephalothorax and abdomen is one way of referring to the segments, and prosoma and epistosoma is the other. Figures that both combinations have one simple word and one really difficult one. All arachnids have this two-part body in some configuration. So now, finally, let's zero in on spiders. They've got the eight legs, the chelicerae, the two-part body plan, so that makes them arachnids, but what makes them spiders? Spiders make silk, which may stand out as an ability among arachnids, 
But silkworms and some mites can make silk, and pseudoscorpions can produce it in their mouths, so the ability to produce silk is common to all spiders, but not unique to spiders. Another feature common to all spiders is venom. There is one exception, a family of spiders that seems to have lost their venom glands, but beyond that, spiders all have venom. Now, some people may be surprised to learn that not all arachnids have venom. Scorpions do, definitely, but this guy? No venom. This guy? No venom. This guy? Also no venom. And I'll digress for a second to mention that this guy, the Harvestman, which is the order of Pileones, is sometimes referred to as a daddy longleg, and is rumored to have some of the deadliest venom known to humanity, but fangs too small to pierce human skin. I'm not sure how that rumor got started, but it is a myth. Because Harvestmen also have, you guessed it, no venom. People often ask, is X spider poisonous? Which is the wrong question, because by asking if it's poisonous, they're technically asking about what will happen if they eat it, which is almost never what they actually want to know. Venomous is what we call it when an animal can inject a toxin into you by biting or stinging. The answer to, is X spider venomous, is virtually always yes, because that's how spiders work. But the answer to, is it dangerously venomous to humans, is almost always a no. At the time of filming this, the World Spider Catalog lists over 50,000 described species of spider in the world, and while a few can give you a really bad day, only a handful of them are capable of doing life-threatening harm to a human. Again, venom is a feature that is common to virtually all spiders, but not unique to spiders. Let's look at the body plan of spiders. As I mentioned before, all arachnids have a prosoma and a pistosoma, or cephalothorax and abdomen. But in spiders, these two segments are particularly distinct, and connected by a very thin tubular structure called the pedicel. In scorpions, one segment sort of flows into the other, Solifuges are a bit more obvious about it, but still not entirely clear. Harvestmen just have this one big fused lump, but in spiders, it's very obvious where one segment ends and another begins. The prosoma, or cephalothorax, is where all the legs attach and where the eyes and brain are. And the epistosoma, or abdomen, is where the magic butt rope comes from. I mentioned earlier that there is one feature that is common to literally all spiders, but also unique to spiders, found nowhere else in the animal kingdom, and it has to do with their reproductive organs. As you learn about spiders, you'll find out that a lot of stuff about them comes down to the genitalia. Just get used to that. These things here are the pedipalps. Now we can see them here on Harriet, this female giant house spider. They're kind of like mini legs at the front of the spider's head. Now, most arachnids have pedipalps, and they're usually specialized in some way. In scorpions and other pinchy-looking arachnids, these are where we see the pinchy bits, as their pedipalps have been specialized for grasping and tearing. In harvestmen, they're mostly sensory organs. But in spiders, they're modified in a unique and remarkable way. Let's go back to Harriet for a second. And here's a picture of Gary, a male giant house spider. You can see that Gary's pedipalps are bigger on the ends. The pedipalps, or palps as they're sometimes called, of male spiders are specially modified for sperm transfer. They're what the male spider uses to get his sperm into the female spider. Now here's a giant house spider's pedipalp under the stereoscope. The palps of this species are actually on the simpler side. Male palps of some species can be really elaborate because the reproductive openings on the females are often shaped to match only the palp design of the males of their own species, like a lock and key. This generally prevents crossbreeding. The other crazy thing about this is that in the male, the sperm doesn't actually start in the palps. It starts in the abdomen, and has to be deposited and then drawn up into the palps. It's a fascinating system, and this particular adaptation is found nowhere else in the animal kingdom. Palps modified for sperm transfer are absolutely unique to spiders. I'll get into this a little bit more in the anatomy video right here. If there's nothing here, then that means I haven't actually made that video yet. Just stay tuned. 
But without getting too deep into the weeds, here's how we can basically define a spider in terms of its morphology, the forms and features of its body. It's an eight-legged invertebrate with an exoskeleton, two distinct body segments, capable of producing silk from spinnerets, with venom-injecting fangs, and with pedipalps modified for transferring sperm, and lives on land and definitely not in space. That could be a working definition of what makes a spider a spider, the animals that make up the order Araneae within the class Arachnida. Ultimately, spiders are our friends too. Without them, we wouldn't last very long. And I examine why that is and the role spiders play in the world in the next episode, the ecological significance of spiders, along with what they eat, how much of it they eat, what eats them, how they're useful in biocontrol, what a world without spiders might look like, and how humanity's survival is literally tied to the success of spiders. And if you subscribe and click the bell, you'll be notified when new videos are released so you don't miss any. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this video and what questions you most want answered in this series, and I'll do my best to answer some of those questions as I make the next episodes. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time on Spider Basics Beyond the Eight Legs. Cheers!